I think it's about time we wrapped up Yggdrasil now so that next week we can get into the character profile videos. A quick recap though, in case this is your first time watching one of these videos. In our first one, we went over the general information of Yggdrasil as a game, as well as the creation and customization of characters. And in the second one, we took a look at the leveling and tier magic system, as well as how casting mechanics worked. And now I'll just try to put together all the other miscellaneous information, starting with some more stuff about the world. As you'd expect from any fantasy RPG, dungeons also lay hidden throughout each of the nine realms, but they're most definitely not the type of dungeon that you'd expect. Imagine the entire game of Dark Souls as a single dungeon. Now, that may be an over-exaggeration in terms of size, but each one was said to be absolutely massive and contain various types of biomes within a single one. So there could be both an ever-extending swampland and a vast desert in the same dungeon. Wandering into a dungeon or even just doing one without any preparation was something that would most likely end up leading to a very quick death. That's because as you explored farther away from the central area of the world, the harder everything became. This is a relatively standard concept for a game of this type, where the higher level areas are at the very outskirts of the world. But considering how massive each world was, and the lack of borders indicating the level requirements for each area, it'd be pretty hard to determine how skilled you needed to be in order to know that you can successfully traverse an area. But not only did the monsters become stronger, the terrain itself became a threat if you weren't properly equipped. It would have been like Link traveling into Goron City without any flame resistance in Breath of the Wild. Some were so difficult that 36-man raiding parties called legions were required, and guilds were able to join forces in order to attempt to defeat it together. Sharing the loot with another guild, though, may not have been the most appealing aspect to many players. Being the first to clear a dungeon meant having 10% more loot spawn, and offered higher leveled equipment as a reward. Then there were the guild-based dungeons, where the reward for clearing it was gaining ownership and occupation over it. As you already know, the Great Tomb of Nazareth is one of these dungeons. Though it was one of the more difficult simultaneous attack dungeons, it wasn't the hardest. There existed 9 dungeons, 1 per realm, and these allowed for NPC data storage of up to 3000 levels. You see, guild bases were dungeons that had levels embedded into it. The number of levels dictated the maximum combined level of custom NPCs that you could have to defend your base. And usually, the harder the dungeon was, the more levels of NPC data storage it would have. Of course you could upgrade the amount of levels that your base had by paying for it, like they did with the Great Tomb of Nazareth, but to find one with 3000 levels already was limited to one per realm. You also weren't able to claim multiple dungeons at once and divide your bases up either. If you came across a guild based dungeon with a higher level that you wanted, you would first have to leave the other one. One more component to guild bases was the maintenance costs. Everything from the creation of NPCs to the base's defenses required serious financing. If you ever wanted to hinder a guild financially, then attempting to raid their base would be your best bet since immediately re-establishing traps, repairing damages, and reviving NPCs all cost gold. You were allotted a certain sum of damage that could be repaired for free every day, but that would take a significant amount of time to bring everything back to its original state, so the fastest way to just fix everything was to just pay for it. Which brings us to the game's currency. So along with managing the guild-based defense system and summoning or reviving NPCs, Gold can also be used to cast certain spells, and of course, buy or craft in-game items. Alongside gold was also data crystals. They occasionally dropped as loot from killed monsters. And these were little data storage items that enabled every aspect of customization in the game. If you weren't already aware, customization was this game's bread and butter. Data crystals in combination with a separately purchasable creator tool allowed for pretty much unlimited in-game cosmetic customization. Everything from the color, shape, and style of your chestplate to the flavor text data and appearance of golden XP drops. You name it. If it was a visible feature in the game, it was most likely customizable. Created NPCs had an even greater degree of customization because you could design them and make their build any way that you could imagine. Their personalities would be detailed in their backstory, and their appearances and abilities were dictated by your choice of racial and class levels. And all this was possible so long as you had enough data crystals to do so. For example, Tabula had used so much of Nazarick's free data capacity with the designs of his NPCs that other guild members had started to complain about it. He was forced to end up using cash items in order to give himself more data to work with. So the more customization you did, the more data storage you'd need, and therefore, data crystals became just as or even more important than gold. Though it's not only for pimping out your armor so you can flex on everyone else. Enhancing certain gear or crafting magical items was also possible with high level data crystals. 
If you were lucky enough to come across a high level data crystal, you could upgrade an item to the highest class, though that item had to already meet some rather rare requirements first. When it came to items, data crystals were the very essence of them. Items were actually dropped in the form of data crystals. That way they could customize the way the item looked, all while keeping the in-game stats the same. All you had to do was insert or infuse the data crystal into the item's skin. So long as the item had enough data capacity, you could put however many data crystals into it. This is actually a fairly clever way of allowing personal design of your equipment without it having affect any of your abilities as a player. I could just imagine someone dressing themselves up in rookie gear or like a no skin, but have the most insane stats inserted into it. That would be a pretty funny way of trolling some PKers. So if we look into the items now, this should help you understand a bit more how data crystals and data capacity play a significant role in power levels. As I'm sure you already know, items have different ranks that range from the weakest in the low tier, all the way up to the strongest in the divine tier. Then in between you have middle, high, top, legacy, relic, and legendary. These ranks were given based on the item's data size, so the more data an item had, the higher rank that item would be. And an item's data size was determined by the materials that the item was made out of. The more rare the world metals and minerals were, the greater the data capacity, which made adventuring a prominent aspect of the game. If you wanted that diamond sword, well you better start strip mining cause you'd have to channel your inner minecraft and find those rare resources. But once you had those resources, you could create a large data capacity item and stack a fair number of data crystals into it, hopefully bringing it up into that divine class tier. Though the rare metals and high level data crystals were so far and few between that it was an achievement to even have a single divine class item. Unless of course you had the money to spend on trying to roll for one through the game's gacha system. Within the Tomb of Nazareth, there are around 14 known divine class items, most of which we actually saw Ainz use in his battle against Shaltir. This includes Amaterasu and Tsukiyomi, formerly used by Nishiki, female sensei's Iron Fist of Wrath from Tamaiko, Hoi's bow from Peroronchino, the giant meat cleaver called Suck the Blood and Eat the Flesh, and Takemakazuchi's Takemakazuchi Mark VIII. A few of the guardians also have their own, including Albedo's Hermes Chismegestus armor, Shaltir's Spewit Lance, Mare's Shadow of Yggdrasil, and Kakutis's Godslaying Emperor Blade. Then there's other items like the Ring of Ainz Ulogon, and the gacha item Shooting Star. Exceeding the Divine category though are the exclusive guild weapons and world or world champion items. Guild weapons are the singular representation of the existence of your guild. This was the item that needed to be crafted with the most care because it was allowed to have a significant amount of data storage attached to it, far surpassing that of the Divine class and approaching that of the world class. But once again, the data capacity of this weapon was determined by the crafting resources used and the skill of the crafter. Even if this weapon was poorly designed and crafted, it would still have significant power over the divine class items. The thing about the guild weapon though is that if this weapon was destroyed or broken by any means, it would signify the end of your guild. Your guild would essentially be disbanded and your entire member list would gain a title shaming you as a symbol of failure for being unable to protect the core item of your guild. Then there are the world items, which are so ridiculously overpowered that they actually break the mechanics of the game. Or at least they're capable of overriding various fundamental game mechanics in order to change the very system of it. Some devs thought it would be a good idea to create wildcard items that anyone could stumble across and use to just become Kirito temporarily and ignore any facet of game balance. I'm not even joking about that by the way. One item called Ouroboros can be used to make direct contact with the devs of Yggdrasil and request for one wish to be implemented in the game. It's actually quite funny how this world item was used in the light novel, but I think I'll save that story and the rest of the world items and their abilities for a separate video. They're just too ridiculous to not talk about separately. Anyway, the only way to counter these godlike items were to either have one of your own or have a special job class. But with regards to how they fit into the game, before the world tree had been attacked by a monster and left with only 9 leaves to represent each of the 9 realms, there once were many leaves that covered it. But after the monster had eaten a majority of those leaves, the remnants of them, totaling a number of 200, were said to have been scattered across the remaining 9 in the form of the world items, each carrying the power of a world inside of them. World champion items on the other hand were very similar in power to guild weapons. Only 9 existed in Yggdrasil though, one of which was Touch Me's armor. They were given as gifts directly from the admins to the winners of a martial tournament. Being a world champion solidified your position as one of the strongest players in Yggdrasil. It gave you the ability to walk around with a piece of equipment that completely outclasses everything other than world items. 
and it was also exclusive to you unless a spell like Perfect Warrior was cast to enable temporary use by somebody else. Alright, now the final topic for this video is going to be on monsters and boss fights. Just like in any game, there was an aggro system built in that allowed monsters to focus on certain targets. In Intrasil, it was a numeric value described as hate that increases with the amount of damage you did, how much healing you were doing, what types of spell you were casting, and so on and so forth. If you were to get hit by a monster, your hate would decrease and aggro could then switch to the person with higher hate than you. Apparently, the hate value was displayed during combat so it made it easier for players to manage the aggro. Bosses on the other hand came in different levels. Dungeon and raid bosses weren't impossible challenges. They were difficult, but very much beatable with a solid strategy. World enemies on the other hand were hidden bosses with powers on a level that could be compared to the world items. Defeating them was certainly no easy task since their abilities could nullify resistances and their strength rivaled legion-sized groups. Some were even referred to as level-breaking bosses. These were monsters that had names like the Lords of the Seven Deadly Sins or the Five Rainbow Buddhas, and they were strong enough to even make the members of Nazarek hesitate when deciding whether to fight or not. Though the rewards for beating them would make the fight well worth it, it was thought that beating the Lords of the Seven Deadly Sins would drop a world-class item. But being able to beat it? Well, that's a whole nother issue. Okay, and I guess that brings us to the end of Yggdrasil Part 3. Next week or so, we shall move on to some character profiles, so be sure to go vote in the community poll for which character you'd like to learn more about. I think there's some other Yggdrasil stuff that I could talk about, but I'm sure it'll come up in another video in some way or the other. There's still plenty of other topics that need to be covered as well, like guilds and the Great Tomb of Nazarek, so there definitely isn't a shortage of content. I just need to find the time to make it. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!